So what do normal people get up to on Valentine's Day? A fancy restaurant, exchanging roses and presents, eating heart-shaped chocolate and contemplating your eternal loneliness? And what do I get up to on Valentine's Day? Well, wandering around a museum and discussing the three different methods of shark reproduction, of course. This Valentine's Day, the Natural History Museum opened its galleries for two evenings of romance featuring animal courtship, copulation and everything in between. Have you ever shown someone how much you like them by choreographing an elaborate routine or by molting your entire head? I can't say I have, but I've definitely been inspired by some of the fossils and creatures that the experts had on display. After a one year break, Valentine's at the museum was back for a second time. When I first heard about the event in 2020, I thought it was an amazing idea and I really wanted to go except that I lived in York at the time, which is a little bit far for an evening trip. So I was super happy when I saw it being advertised again this year, and I picked up tickets faster than you can say crustaceous period. I didn't properly vlog the night because I wanted to actually enjoy the event and I didn't want to make anyone feel uncomfortable by accidentally filming them on their date night, but I got some decent pictures. The whole museum was lit in wonderful magenta, including the iconic entrance hall and Hope the Whale, who is currently keeping Dippy the Diplodocus's spot warm while they finish up their tour around the country. There was a band playing in front of Old Charles Darwin, and all the galleries were open for display, including the usually paid for wildlife photography exhibition and the members only rooms. The first stop was an obligatory admiration of Mary Anning's fossils. Then it was on to the cafe for food. The tickets included a free drink, and what could be better than free drinks? Only heart-shaped pizza and pink strawberry cupcakes. I had a vegan pizza, which was actually good. Mmm, pine nuts and roast aubergines. I was obsessed. Other museums could learn something here. My favourite part though was that all the tables were set up for couples on the third wheel. So verdict. Loved it lots. Then we went to have a look at some of the science stations. This was the main appeal of the night, for me at least. The paleontologists and anatomists had areas set up with things from the museum collections, pictures, props, videos, microscopes and everything else, where you could learn about appropriate Valentine's topics. There was a station about things from nature that are being considered aphrodisiacs and whether there is any evidence to confirm it. Another station was about smells to attract mates in nature, yummy. My favourite was about everyone's favourite ancient ocean predator, sharks. There were some very sharp teeth that you could hold and a long dead baby shark in a giraffe. And apparently sharks are three different ways of reproduction. Extremely smart creatures indeed. All the downstairs exhibitions were open including the bugs, the birds, the mammals and the iconic dinosaurs. There were even animal handlers who were showing everyone snakes and giant snails. And one thing you notice when there are no children in a museum is how many children are usually in a museum. Especially the dinosaur and insect galleries which are very kid friendly. Rather than the dulcet tones of a kid laughing as their little brother cries in fear by the animatronic T-Rex. It was just couples wandering around in low lighting. Obviously I never mind children at a museum because that's exactly who should be there, but the vibes on this night were immaculate. Super chill, super aesthetic, just a great time. In the Natural History Museum, there is always something unexpected to realise you're obsessed with, and this night was no different. While I spotted an old label on the back of an object, the museum gained a new rock fan. Unfortunately the big rock room was closed for the night, so that means we'll just have to return for another visit. Why is the minerals gallery so interesting? It's literally just a room full of rocks in 19th century cabinets with very little interpretation or explanation panels. And yet everyone I visit the museum with ends up loving it the best. Maybe it's our innate attraction to shiny things. And now to the part that sparked this video, the LGBTQ plus natural history trail. Who doesn't love a museum trail? Normalized adults doing the museum trail. The prize for guessing all the answers right was a lucky draw into a lottery to win a year's membership to the museum, so the stakes were high. And I can proudly say I met the challenge and handed in a sheet of correct answers, even if we did wander up and down trying to find the last one. There was one thing in the trail that we found the most intriguing by far, and that was one Hungarian aristocrat who pioneered methods of paleobiology while spying for the Austro-Hungarian Empire and riding around Europe on his motorbike with his secretary slash boyfriend and becoming so obsessed with Albanian language and culture that he offered to be their king. You know those people from history whose life stories just keep giving? Well this is one of them. Okay, where to start with this guy? This is the Natural History Museum after all, so let's begin with his contributions to paleontology. 
Franz Notcher was born in 1877 in Transylvania and he gained his PhD in geology in 1903 from the University of Vienna. His PhD focused on geologically mapping the area around his family estate. As children, his little sister had found some dinosaur bones on the estate and he set to work puzzling out what his vast ancestral lands could tell us about our giant predecessors. Franz was coming from the back of a century where paleontology and geology were all about categorising rocks, bones and anything else found in nature before storing them in an appropriate museum cabinet with labels stuck on them with a glue so sticky we can never take them off now without risk of damaging the object. Paleontology at this time was mostly about documenting the shape of the bones, figuring out how they work together and giving precise names to each dino species. Franz, meanwhile, was ahead of the game with his dinosaur interests. He wanted to know about how dinosaurs existed as living biological creatures, rather than just looking at them as a pile of bones. He wanted to know why dinosaurs were different sizes, he wanted to know how they reproduced, and he wanted to discover a way to determine the sex of dinosaurs. These are the kind of questions scientists might ask today, but back then in the 19th century, this approach was novel and unheard of. This is why Franz Nopcher is considered a pioneer of paleobiology. One of his achievements was his theory of dinosaur insular dwarfism. He noticed that some dinosaur bones were smaller than expected. He deduced this might be because of a lack of food made some dinosaurs smaller to save energy. This theory is also known today as the island rule, and it is widely accepted by scientists. So well done, Franz. Another of Franz's interests was about how to determine the sex of dinosaurs. He thought he had discovered a phallic looking bone, but unfortunately he was wrong. Now it is considered nearly impossible to sex dinosaurs unless they have found of eggs inside of them. But 10 out of 10 for the effort. Now, all of this would be impressive enough, but Franz was also out there living the early of 20th century life. In 1906, he met Bayazid El Mazdoda and hired him as his secretary. They moved in with each other and spent all their lives together getting up to all kinds of adventures. In 1907, they went on an exhibition to the little visited Albanian mountains where they were kidnapped by famous bandit Mustafa Lita, who demanded 10,000 Turkish pounds for Franz's release, and then a whole complicated saga ensued. Franz thought they should just shoot Mustafa to put an end to this nonsense, but realised that was probably a little bit extreme. Doda said that, instead of demanding money, Mustafa could send out Franz as a spy in prison since he was already in native dress. Apparently, everything went well in prison, but while all of this was happening, Doda's dad had turned up to the rescue with ten armed retainers, and the bear had to dissuade him from shooting Mustafa. Now, the first year of any relationship can be quite eventful, but this is on a whole different level. Franz and Doda's adventures didn't stop there. During the Balkans War and the First World War, Franz spied for Austria-Hungary, including as an undercover shepherd in Transylvania. He was in charge of Albanian war volunteers, and he was the first person to carry out an aircraft hijacking to flee the short-lived Hungarian Soviet Republic in 1919. But then the First World War stripped Franz of his family's ancestral wealth, so he had to <gasps> get a real job. He went to work as head of the Hungarian Geological Institute in 1925, but he didn't like the office job lifestyle too much. So instead, Franz and Doda went on a motorbike trip all around Europe to study fossils together. Someone please write a historical fiction novel about two motorcycling fossil hunting lovers roving around Europe. In Franz's memoir entry about meeting Doda, he said, He has been the only person who has truly loved me and in whom I have had full confidence. Franz found a tarsal fossil and decided to name it after Doda. It roughly translates as the beautiful box of Bayazid, because the fossil shape reminded him of Doda's <coughs> How romantic. So Franz Nopcher has already made big contributions to geology, paleobiology, and to queer history. But he didn't stop there. Oh no, 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 no. He was also obsessed with Albanian culture and became the early 20th century's leading expert on everything Albania. He learned all the languages and dialects in Albania, and was always wearing the traditional dress. After the Balkans War, Albania needed a new king, and Franz offered himself for the role as expert in all things Albania. That he was kinda broke was no matter for Franz, because he had an excellent plan ready. He would marry an eager American heiress, who wanted to be a European royal, and he would take her money to fund his reign. Easy. For reasons unknown, this plan was rejected and someone else was chosen to be king of Albania instead. Franz published over 50 papers about Albania, and he left many more unpublished works. So not only did he come up with some paleobiological theories that were ahead of his time, but he also produced so many manuscripts, drawings and writings about Albania, 
including the very first geological map of northern Albania, that his works make up a large portion of the Albanological section of Albania's National Library. This is too much for one man. It shouldn't be allowed. Unfortunately, Franz and Doda didn't have a happy ending. Franz encountered financial difficulties in his later life that led him to selling his fossil collection to the Natural History Museum. And then his physical and mental health began to decline. He shot himself in 1933, age 55, but before that he slipped sleeping powder into Doda's tea and shot him so that he would not be left alone to live in poverty and sadness. So quite a tragic ending. I can see why the Natural History Museum's LGBTQ plus history trail left out that part. Anyway, that was my night at the museum. I am already waiting to buy tickets for next year and I'm hoping I've encouraged some of you guys to visit Natural History Museum too, whether it's for Valentine's Day or not. There are so many interesting things from millions of years ago to look at, and the history of the study of natural history itself is super interesting too. For some reason, all the paleontologists and geologists had such fascinating lives. I already love and admire Mary Anning, but Franz Nopcher has joined on my list of favourites too. Every time I read about his life, it seems to get crazier. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Museum Monday. I hope you enjoy learning about Franz as much as I did. If you think more people need to know about him, then don't forget to leave a like and a comment for the algorithm. And I hope to see you again for the next adventure, although I cannot promise it will be as wild as Franz and Doda's.